Yeah, you know, I want to do pretty good there. I got a man. Required. Good morning. Uh, the Elections Committee will call, be called to order. Uh, today, uh, we have the a representative from Progress Missouri here to report. Uh, and also, I apologize. House Communications. House Communications. I apologize for that. Uh, also, uh, we welcome everybody today. We're going to be here at House Bill 1073 and HJR 47. Uh, Ms. Van, would you please call the roll? Chair Anthony. Here. Last Chair Anthony. Here. Representatives Conway. Here. Cox. Here. Dunn. Here. Boson. Here. Hurst. Holtmeyer. Here. McGall. Newman. Here. Bausch. Here. And Weber. Here. Okay. All right. Uh, the first order of business will be to hear House Bill 1073. Representative Decker. Good morning, Madam Chairman. Uh, for the record, my name is Tony Decker. I represent the 141st District, uh, which is Wright County in the uh, eastern half of Webster County. And thank you very much for hearing House Bill uh, 1073. As you're aware, House Bill 1073 sets the guidelines down for uh, flu ID in the uh, state of Missouri. Uh, one thing before I will start that before House Bill 1073 could go into effect, we would have to pass a constitutional amendment in the state which would allow uh, photo ID, which I think is the next bill that you're hearing this morning. So keep that in mind that my bill would only go into effect if we, if the voters of the state pass that constitutional amendment. With that, uh, I'll go through a little bit of the bill and tell you about it. Uh, the bill requires a photo ID uh, in all public elections in the uh, state of Missouri, and that photo ID being a non-expired expired Missouri driver's license or a non-expired Missouri non-driver's license. Uh, it can also be a uh, ID with a photo, a non-expired ID from the Missouri National Guard, uh, the U.S. Armed Forces, or the U.S. Department of Vet Veterinary Veteran Affairs, uh, or any ID that is issued by the state that has a photo on it that uh, also, uh, I believe, has a signature on it. Those are the types of ID that could be accepted uh, to vote. Now, 
I have made some exemptions in my bill, and I would like to uh, mention those. If you have an inability to pay for a birth certificate, then you are exempted from the statute. If you were born on or before January 1st, 1949, then you are also exempted. If you have a religious uh, belief against uh, forms of personal ID or photos, then you would also be exempt. If you have a physical or mental disability or handicap, you are exempt. So when you go to the polling place, you would sign an affidavit that you meet one of these requirements, and you would be given a provisional ballot. Okay? Under those exemptions, that provisional ballot would go back to the election authority where they would verify your signature on that uh, verification compared to your signature that's on file uh, on your voter registration card. And that's how it, they would be determine if your provisional ballot would count or not. Um, the other provision would be for the person who maybe shows up to the poll who just left their photo ID at home. And that person would also be able to cast a provisional ballot, but ballot to count. Any cost associated with this bill would be paid by the state of Missouri. And uh, that's explicitly spelled out under uh, Section 8. And if the costs are not provided, then this process does not go into place. And with that, most of the bill, I think, is just renumbering on the last few pages. With that, uh, uh, Madam Chairman, let me just give you a reason today why I think we need photo ID because uh, I think that's probably going to be more the discussion today than, than the nuts and bolts of my bill. And uh, let me just give you an example of when I was a county clerk uh, down in Wright County. And as you're aware, every couple of years we were required to mail out voter ID cards uh, to all the voters in the, uh, in the county. And it, it happened every year that someone would come into my office bringing a voter ID card and say, I got this in my mailbox and I have no idea who this is. And they give it back to me. Uh, you know, how easy would it be for somebody to say, oh, here, I've got an extra photo ID card. I can now go impersonate somebody because that's all it takes is go to the polls, lay down that voter ID card, and you can vote. And I think that there, while I'm not going to cite any cases of impersonation in the state of Missouri, I'm telling you the, the opportunity exists that it could happen. And so today, that's why I am uh, presenting you with this photo ID bill, and I would be glad to answer any questions. Mr. Cox. Uh, to inquire. Yes. Uh, so what you're saying is that uh, there have been a lot of cases of uh, fraudulent uh, registrations in the state, right? Yes. Uh, those are well documented, and I've got several. Uh, so why would somebody uh, falsely register? Why would they do that? So that they could falsely vote somebody. Okay, okay. So, I mean, there's there's only one logical. I mean, people do things illogical every now and then. But essentially, fraudulent registration is for the purpose of fraudulent voting, which seems sensible. Right. right. Uh, and that even happens in Wright County. That is, people fraudulently register because these were bogus registrations that you described. Yes. I appreciate it. Thank you. Any other questions? Mr. Copeland. Mr. Inquirer, Madam Chair. Yes, sir. Good morning, Representative. Good morning. Thank you for uh, offering this bill. Um, is voting a constitutional right? 
voting, yes, it is a constitutional right. Is owning a gun a constitutional right? Yes.
mean, that happens. We know that people, in terms of, of moving or whatever, they're incorrectly registered. Uh, because we don't really have a database that beyond county to county for people to actually you know, verify where they're registered to vote. The term bill has We actually have a statewide database now that covers the whole state. Okay, but your bill would have nothing to do with voter registration. I mean, that's a whole separate issue, a whole separate statute. So if you're assuming that there is no fraud and no fraud that you know of that's actually being you know, um, committed, even though there is an opportunity, like there is an opportunity for me to go next door and rob someone. Uh, Plenty of election laws that, that cover people who don't follow them. Uh, so if, if there is no fraud, what would be the actual purpose of your bill? I think every vote is important. And I think every person is entitled to vote who is legally registered to vote. But if there is a chance that someone would commit uh, any type of impersonation, I think we should have something in effect to stop it. Um, are you aware that there would be eligible longtime voters who would no longer be able to vote who have done nothing wrong, but under your proposal would no longer be able to vote legally? I don't believe that's correct. You don't believe there is? I think I have made an exception for, for every person. So, and also for the record, you know, someone that, that's not going to fall under one of these exceptions. Well, let's let's go into those exceptions a little bit. Um, for the record, can you explain what a provisional ballot is? Because you mentioned all under the exceptions under current law. What a provisional ballot is, or as well, that's the only law we've got right now. It's the provisional ballot that I'm talking about that creates a new law for provisional ballots. Well, under current law, it just under the just definition of, of and how it works in terms under of under current law uh, in the uh, state of Missouri, if you show up to the polls and your name's not on the book, and they call back to the election authority and they don't show you registered anywhere in the county, but you're certain that you registered to vote, whether you did it at the DVM, at the health department, you know, or somewhere, then you get the option of voting a provisional ballot. And then that gives the election authority, I think it's up to two weeks, to see if they can actually find that voter registration. And because there could be a chance that it could have gotten lost in the, in the paperwork somewhere. So that gives the election authority that opportunity to find that. If they find that, then that provisional ballot can count but as a vote at that time. Is That's the current law for a provisional ballot. Now, is a provisional ballot treated the same as a real ballot? As in, it's included in the count as, as a regular ballot. I mean, it's the same ballot. Um, the only difference that I have a provisional ballot is it goes in the provisional ballot envelope and it's not counted until after the election. If it meets if certain it meets the requirements. So, but the main requirement is that the person would have to have accurate registration in that county or in that precinct. <coughs> so would you agree, though, that provisional ballots are not treated as a real ballot? You have to meet these other criteria for them to actually count. It's the same ballot. I don't, I don't know why you would not think it's not a real ballot. How many provisional ballots are, are normally counted, even like, say, on a statewide election? You know, I don't know. Percentage. I would say it's not a large percentage because, again, most of these people are not qualified to vote. I mean, you have to meet the qualifications. And so if you don't meet those, then you shouldn't be casting a vote. So provisional ballots are for those registrations that somehow slipped through the pile and got lost. or And so you, I wouldn't think you would see a large number. Uh, provisional ballots actually counting? A large percentage of them under this current law, I, I would not see that you would see a large percentage of them counting. Um, that's important. That's important because even though you list these exemptions, and, and your experience is obviously in the county, my experience is actually with the you know county board of elections where we have right. a great, you know, large volume of, of, of current voters. And provisional ballots are normally given out, and I'm gonna let the experts, you know, speak to this too. 
They're normally given out by an election judge if there is any question about their eligibility to vote on election day, correct? And for all kinds of reasons, but you do have to meet that criteria. And I'm concerned that your exemptions are promising a real ballot when effect they probably won't count. Well, the provisions in this bill are not the same for provisional ballots that are currently in law today. So in order for these provisional ballots to count, all the county clerk has to do is match the signature that's on file with the signature on the uh, envelope. So it's not like you're trying to go out and find somebody's voter registration. Uh, you've already determined that the person's registered to vote. They don't have a photo ID. So all you're matching up is their signature. So the requirement to count the provisional ballot under the bill that I'm producing is not the same requirement under that is in law under the current provisional ballot. Well, I'm glad you're talking about two different provisional ballots here. Correct. But I'm glad you brought up the signature issue because, again, you know, you're talking the difference between a county clerk and also a, an election judge. Um, you know, particularly in St. Louis County with the high volume of voting. And basically, a judge, election judge, later, someone would have that authority to determine if that signature does match. And we're talking perhaps signatures that could be up to 50, 60 years old. So therefore, you know, the, the likeliness of those signatures actually matching are, are very rare, particularly when you talk about the age exemption in your bill. Well, I don't actually think that's a correct statement either. Uh, one of the opportunities that I had as county clerk one year was to do a mail-out election in a uh, special election that we had. And in a mail-out election, you mail out those ballots, they come back, and you compare those signatures on every one of those ballots. And we found that those signatures were not that hard to match up. I mean, we didn't have any problem with them. And you had uh, people who'd been registered a long time from people who'd been registered a short time. So it was not a problem. Thank you. I'm glad you clarified there wasn't a problem. Um, are you aware of how this bill could affect women voters? Affect who? Um, women voters. You know, those women that kind of determine elections. Is there any stipulations in here that make it tough for a current eligible woman voter to continue to vote? I don't believe so. Are you familiar with the number of women voters that we have in the state? Not, I mean, as to how many that there is. Well, let me point out to you there is, a, a, according to the census um, that was done in 2012, uh, right now in terms of registered voters, and that number could have changed. This is from 2012. Um, about uh, 3,384,000 registered Missouri voters, and 52.48% of those registered voters in Missouri are women. It's a higher average than normal. So it's rounded off to 52%. And with those women voters, 90% of women, this is a national average, have at some point in their life changed their last name through marriage, divorce. And 34% of those voting age women do not have these current documents that would be required to obtain a photo ID if they, if they currently don't have one. Again, state issued non-expired driver's license or non-driver's license. Um, and as you know, with women changing their name through these, you know, uh, different life events, you know, using hyphenated last names, using one name professionally, one name personally, they're not going to have their exact name on every single document. Um, I changed my name when I got married, and believe me, I remember the hassles it was to go through and change everything to reflect that's who I was. And with their 40-50% divorce rate, again, women are not keeping all of their documents up to date because there's no reason to. There's no reason they need to. So for them who would be falling under this category of not having a non-expired driver's or non-driver's license. Who is going to pay for all those documents that they need to go find in terms of if they were married out of state, if they were born out of state, if they were divorced out of state? Who is going to go pay to, to get those documents to be able to come in to actually get that state-issued ID? I believe my bill uh, provides 
all of those? That we will pay for one photo ID. Well, that's the but what about the documents required to get that? I'm assuming they're covered as well, because the bill says we will pay for okay. one photo ID if you don't have one. Well, that's where the problem is, because there is an additional expense to get those documents required to get that photo ID. The photo ID is, itself is, a, is a, a, a nominal fee. But the other documents, including the, you know, the, the time available, is, is the problem. And if that's the issue, if, and I'm not talking about just time and expense, and the fact that you have to go get these documents to get your photo ID, isn't that just one more hurdle for women voters? And I believe I uh, added an, an exemption to cover if you couldn't get the birth certificate or other supporting document that you could, could vote the provisional ballot. Which we've already determined You've got to have that signature match, and you have all these other hoops you've got to go through to make sure that your vote actually becomes a real vote, a real ballot that actually really counts. Well, you're calling a lot of hoops with just the election authority being the signatures. But you've got to come up with those additional documents for that to even to even happen. No, it's an exemption. Well. This is what I'm, I'm pulling out. You've, you've got these exemptions, and you've got this strategy that we're going to give you a provisional ballot, and then later on we'll, you know, worry about if you're, you know, up to two weeks later if your signature matches. Again, that's a, you know, a subjective decision. But if there is no voter fraud, and I would assume that you would think there's no women voter fraud, why are these women not eligible to continue voting? Now, why do we need this law? There is no voter fraud. There is no women voter fraud. Why should they jump through all these hoops to perhaps, perhaps cast a personal ballot that may not there's even count? There's never been any voter fraud. In you just said there's nothing ever I said that there's no impersonation. Which this is the only thing this bill would cover. Right. If Correct? We're talking about voter fraud. We're talking about voter impersonation. Well, if there has never been any you charge case of voter impersonation fraud. You also stated that fraud. you think that there's an opportunity that it could happen. There's an opportunity for so, me to do lots of things. I'm not going I to think that. every vote is important. And I think we should protect the integrity of elections. And I think if there's an opportunity for voter impersonation, then I think we should have a law that prevents that from happening. And evidently, you disagree with me. I strongly disagree with you. But let me tell you why. We're not talking really about voter integrity, are we? We're talking about a significant number of people. And again, the number has is around 200,000 in terms of currently right now registered voters who do not have a... That number keeps changing. Well, sure it does. Sure it does. But we have... Cause there's, it's never going to be a set number. But right now, it's about 200,000 people of current long-time eligible voters in the state who have done nothing wrong. They have been voting just fine. And they will have a question mark if they will be able to continue to vote with this proposal. And how many of those 200,000 fall under these exemptions? We have no idea. But it doesn't matter what the number is. You just so said that we have to maintain the integrity. Can you identify the those 200,000? You just already assumed that we have to maintain the integrity of voting. That every vote matters. It's new in Mr. Duck. Uh, because of the time that we are allotted today, and I'm sure our uh, audience has several things that they want to say, we're going to have to put them, we're going to have to put everyone on the time limit here. So, um, Ms. Newman, um, let, me just, let me just finish here and I'll we'll move on. If you could, okay. What I'd like to point out to you, um, Representative, is that there is no voter fraud, and you mentioned that people's voting should have some type of integrity. If there is one there's person... no voter impersonation. Don't, you can't say there's no voter there fraud. There is no voter impersonation okay. fraud, which is one your bill covers. Okay, that's fine. But the real reason we know behind this bill, and it's not just in Missouri, it's around the country, it's every single state, is to make it impossible for a certain segment of voters to continue to vote in terms of... And most of these again, are women. So again, that's your that opinion. My, my opinion is I'm trying I need to, to, finish my to protect the integrity of elections. I your understand. opinion is different from mine. But I, that's why I have an opportunity to question you. But what I'm pointing out, there's a significant number of people, more than one, 
that fall into various groups in terms of the minorities, disabled, working poor, out state students who will no longer be eligible and able to vote under your bill. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Mr. Dunn? Two inquiries. Good morning, Representative. Good morning. Uh, I've just got a few questions. Uh, the first question, uh, would you say that it's true that your bill is unconstitutional based on the current uh, state constitution? My bill is unconstitutional. Without the HJR passing, your my bill, bill is unconstitutional. My bill will go into effect. My, my, there's a clause in my bill that it's only effective upon passage of a constitutional amendment. And that's because it would be unconstitutional based upon the current constitution. I don't know about that. But the way I've got this bill set up, that the constitutional amendment must pass before my bill would go into effect. So in essence, we're letting the voters decide. You still haven't answered the question, though, in terms of if your bill is unconstitutional. I don't believe. I don't believe it is. Why don't you believe that? Why, why don't you believe the HJR then if it's not unconstitutional? My bill is not unconstitutional because it's contingent upon the HJR passing. So my bill would not. My bill, in essence, would, is not going to exist if the constitutional amendment does not pass. They're tied together. They're one. Without that, again, this would be unconstitutional based upon the current status of our state constitution, correct? I don't know. I don't know where you're going, but they're they're together. They're what they're they're tied together. We have to change our constitution in order for this law to become. That's correct. So. Based upon that, then I would say that this is unconstitutional based upon our current status of our constitution. Um, sort of the next question, you know, I still haven't really heard a compelling reason for why we need this law from you. You know, you yourself have stated that there have been no known instances of voter impersonation fraud uh, here in the state. This is the only thing that your bill is attempting to address. You sit, uh, speak to uh, how would you, how would you catch an impersonation fraud in the state? I don't know. That, that, no, I don't know. But, but you think but the opportunity my exists, Let me right? Answer my question now. And so, you know, one of the things you did talk about uh, um, voter registration fraud. So why are we not addressing that issue, but only looking at voter ID? <laughs> when it sounds like to me, from what you have testified this morning that voter registration fraud is where the problem is and not with voter impersonation. My testimony is that there's an opportunity for voter impersonation fraud. But why are we not addressing the issue that well, you have said is a real issue? You're entitled to file a bill just like I am. So if you want to file a bill that deals with voter registration fraud, and go ahead today. I'm dealing with voter impersonation. There is definitely an opportunity in the state or voter impersonation fraud. How would you catch it if you don't have a photo ID requirement in place? How are you going to catch voter impersonation fraud without this ID? How, how do you catch criminals in general? Well, normally you catch them in the act of, of the crime. But we've never caught anyone in the act of attempting to impersonate another person. Because there's no way to catch him. If you don't have a photo ID, how would you possibly catch him? So I, I kind of want to go back to the unconstitutional question. Um, you said that you don't believe that your bill is unconstitutional. Um, just recently in Pennsylvania, their voter ID law was struck down based on it being unconstitutional. Um, also in Wisconsin, uh, their voter ID law was uh, ruled unconstitutional. Um, based on these grounds. And I think one important quote I want to read uh, from Dane County Circuit uh, Judge Richard uh, Neese in his decision in Wisconsin stated that without question where it exists, voter fraud corrupts elections and undermines our form of government. The legislature and governor may certainly take aggressive action to prevent its occurrence, but voter fraud is no more poisonous to our democracy than voter suppression. And I think that's exactly what this is an attempt to do, is to suppress the vote um, of individuals. And uh, so I'd like to hear, again, sort of, do you feel that people are going to be disenfranchised? Gentlemen, I heard that the previous uh, rep went down. And, and again, I'm telling you, that is your opinion. 
My opinion, my opinion is to protect the integrity of elections. So it's a difference of opinion, and we're not going to settle that here today. So, but you know, do you believe that anyone will be disenfranchised by the implementation of this? I do not. I do not. I think I have covered covered everyone in here. And then I, I'll just conclude by you know saying you know again I think we're going to agree to disagree on this. Um, but I think your argument and your reasoning behind uh, this bill is baseless. You have stated that there are no instances of voter impersonation fraud. Um, and so, again, I think this is, um, you know, an attempt to sort of go after a problem that does not exist. Um, and moreover, I think that this is really more politically motivated uh, attempt to silence the voices of law-abiding citizens of their fundamental right to vote. Um, and I think that is absolutely wrong. Um, and, you know, it also seems that we're, you know, picking on uh, individuals who oftentimes seem to vote with the Democratic Party. And to me, that's what it seems like. Again, this is my opinion. That's your opinion. Like I just said, this is my opinion, but I feel like that is what this law is attempting to do. So, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Bowden. Mr. McGuire, please. Yes, sir. Actually, this is good. This is the third year I've heard this, and, and every year you are discounted. Your, your beliefs, your reason for this bill is discounted because you can't give a single incident of voter impersonation, someone being convicted of it in Missouri. So last year I asked of several of the, uh, the witnesses against this bill to present a single incident where, well, states that have voter ID have had problems with it. In other words, the, the side against the bill is saying you're not providing evidence we need the bill. And I'm saying the side against the bill is not providing evidence where this has actually caused a problem. Every year, the people against the bill say that this is going to cause problems. I've looked at the 12 states now that require voter ID. I'm not seeing these problems. And last year, I asked that they bring these forward. So I'm looking forward as all the witnesses come up against where they will give concrete ish or concrete incidents where this voter ID has caused a problem in other states. So would you agree with me if I say I don't believe their testimony if they can't give me concrete evidence where this has been a problem? Sounds reasonable. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Good inquiry, Madam Chair. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. I just want to go over a specific area of uh, the bill and it's in regard to uh, documents. We're, we're saying a document that's issued by the state of Missouri or by the United States, correct? That's correct. That, that's a non-expired document with a photo. Is it not true that if a individual comes to Missouri and is enrolled in a college, university, public or private, that by being within the state, they have the right to vote in the state of Missouri, if they so choose? The gentlemen, they would have to register. Declare, they would have to, well, they have to register to vote, but first off, they have to declare that Missouri is their residence. And at that period of time when they're a resident at that university, they can register and vote in the state of Missouri. That's correct. The documents that we say they are They would good. also want to, to move their driver's license. I mean, if they're going to be a resident in Missouri, then they're going to want to move their Well, if they're, if they're here for nine months and they go back to their homes, they're still allowed to vote in the state of Missouri. If they declare Missouri as their residence. That's correct. But we would not accept an Illinois or a Kansas driver's license. That's correct. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, I have an amendment at a proper time I would move for its adoption. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Any other questions? Mr. McGuire. Yes, sir. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Uh, Representative Newman asked you about 
How many times this had come up? Right question. That was yeah. Way before her tribe, die tribe, and uh, disenfranchising of you and your beliefs. But I was a, a Senate staffer back in 2006, and this came up. So this has been around a long time before you even been here. And in fact, the impetus of all this, and that you may may or may not believe this, was the 2000 election here in Missouri. You were a county clerk at that time. That's correct. You remember reading about uh, the issues that they were having in St. Louis? Yes. Last year when we talked about this bill on the floor, I talked about a, a great book that's been written by John Fund called Stealing Elections. Have you ever read that book? I have not. It's a great book. book. Pick some Sunday afternoon and read that book. There's a whole chapter about Missouri. whole chapter. And within that book, uh, they talk about the, the study that Matt Blunt, who was Secretary of State, did back in 2000 after that election. Uh, he, he found that in St. Louis County, there was a 96% voter registration rate. As a county clerk, would that be a high rate to you? Yes. What's what's the normal rate in a county? Oh, it, it would probably depend on the county, but um, probably 60-70%. Why, why would you think there would be such a high voter registration rate? I don't know. Could it be because they didn't clean the rolls? They, were, they didn't purge the rolls? Maybe fraudulently allowing voter registrations? Well, what Secretary of State Blunt found was that in that 2011 uh, election, or 2000 election, excuse me, that at least 68 people had voted twice. That's 62 felons voted. That's 79 uh, different registrations were individuals registered at a vacant lot. Multiple people registered at a, at a vacant lot. And at least 14 people who were deceased had voted. Now fast forward four years, another statewide office holder thought this was such a problem in St. Louis that they did their own study. You know who that statewide office holder was? It was not. It was our United States Senator McCaskill. Ms. McCaskill did this study. She found that in the 2004 election in St. Louis that there were 24,000 questionable votes. 24,000. She uh, found at least 4,405 dead people were registered to vote. There were 2,242 felons registered to vote. That there was 1,453 people voting from vacant lots. And that there were 15,963 individual voters registered somewhere else in Missouri or Illinois. And she found that in that 2004 election, 945 felons had voted. Our Governor Bob Holden saw this push for provisional ballots, and because of that, we have provisional ballots on the books. Do you agree with that? Uh, yes. Now there's this thing in the law called res ipsa loquitur. It's Latin, and that means the thing speaks for itself. The thing speaks for itself. When you look at these numbers and how skewed they are, you know there has to be voter impersonation fraud. There's no question about it. This isn't about disenfranchisement of voters. This is about voters in our counties not being outnumbered by voter fraud in St. Louis. We've got a Republican Secretary of State who said it. We have a Democrat auditor who has said it. And we have a Democrat governor who has agreed and changed the laws of the state of Missouri because of voter fraud in St. Louis. So anyone who sits on this committee and talks about partisan issues in regards to voting as a farce. The issue in the state of Missouri is that everyone should have the opportunity to vote, but their vote should not be 
outnumbered by someone who will commit voter fraud. And we need to do everything within our power to end voter fraud in our state. I applaud you for your efforts in this. I applaud Representative Cox and his efforts to do this. And everyone else who will stand up for voters in our state so that their votes will count. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions of the committee? Okay, moving on. Um, I know we have several people here today uh, to speak in uh, favor against inform informational purposes. So first of all, those that want to speak in favor of the bill, please raise your hand to uh, those that are going to speak against the bill. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And those for informational purposes only. Okay. Sad to say, we have let the committee do the, the majority of the questions today. So please, we're going to allow you about three minutes each. Uh, please be as brief as you can be, but yes, yet be as consistent as you can be with what you have to say. Okay? All right. Thank you, folks. All right. Uh, Mr. Trevor, do you have anyone here to speak in favor of the bill? I believe we have a couple. You want to? Okay. <coughs> Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Philip Todd. I'm a citizen of the 49th District, Cabot County, Missouri. I'm here to speak in favor of House Bill 1073. I believe that the cornerstone of our representative republic rests on the integrity of our elections. This is very important that we protect that right to where we don't have illegal votes or, or uh, uh, people who are not uh, supposed to be voting, disenfranchising my vote, and disenfranchising me from from uh, from voting. I believe the provision here is uh, uh, the provision to uh, provide the uh, ID for uh, everybody who cannot pay, the documents uh, for people who cannot afford to pay is great. The state of Georgia has had photo ID for seven years now. It's been challenged twice constitutionally and been upheld at both times. They found out in the state of Georgia that all the calls about people that couldn't afford it and were going to be disenfranchised, that when the time came down that the state only ended up paying for seven or nine thousand, correct me, nine thousand, uh, uh, nine thousand IDs across the entire state of Georgia. They also found that voter participation in minorities went up, and this is a seven year, this is a seven year study. This isn't something that just happened last year. They have, they have uh, a line, they have an established uh, guideline right there. Um, I don't believe that we should make exceptions in our voter ID. One of the problems that we have with the long lines at the elections is because we don't have one standardized form of identification. That's why we end up with provisional ballots for. That's why that's why we have long lines and and uh, uh, because people are coming in there and they're not prepared to vote, even though we know the date that the elections are set. We know what the next election is going to be. The elections are very well advertised. People don't have an excuse to not be prepared if they really have the intentions of wanting to vote. So I believe that we need to have the standard ID. Even the country of Mexico, we think of them as being a third world backward country. They have photo ID re requirements for their elections and they have very orderly process. I have a friend who was invited to uh, monitor elections in, Lexi in, in Mexico when they had their last presidential election. And he was amazed at how orderly the election process went. The people there expect to have their ID. They bring their ID to the polls. They cast their ballots. There was very little confusion. The lines were orderly, not long lines. Everybody knew when they were supposed to vote. Everybody knew what day to vote. They were all prepared. We can do that here in America, too. What we need to do is just guarantee that everybody has the ID. We can save 
it may cost the state a little bit of money to uh, to issue identification. Okay. Uh, but I, I believe that we would probably say it. Now I have one other thing just to show here the hypocrisy of people who are against photo ID. This is a copy, these are copies of a flyer that was distributed for a anti-photo ID rally in the state of North Carolina by the NAACP. I have highlighted right here in red and I have several copies so everybody can see it says do bring photo identification driver's license passport or other valid photo ID with you and keep it on your persons at all times now is that preposterous that they would want photo ID for people to attend that kind of a rally but for something as, as uh, uh, sacred as our elections that we need to make exceptions let's get this passed here let's pass House Bill 1073. Let us get fair and free elections across the state of Missouri. Thank you, Mr. Todd. Thank I you. appreciate being here today. And do we have questions for this witness? If so, let's be quick about it. Thank you, sir. Please fill out a witness form. Thank you. Mr. Hubbard. Thank you. I'm Mitch Hubbard. I'm from Callaway County, and I'm in support of this bill. Um, Representative Newman might, might be surprised, but I actually agree with the point she made, and I think that there's a point of agreement between you and Representative Duggar about the supporting documents because I, I, I agree and I've always said that I've said that two or three years ago when I testified here that the, we should take those supporting documents too if that's necessary and actually I did the math assuming my calculator's right we had to pay for one supporting document to go with the photo ID it would cost three million seven hundred fifty thousand that's not too much to have everybody able to vote if they had to pay for two it would be seven million five hundred thousand and then three um, would be 11250000 So it's not astronomical. And to me, more importantly than voter ID is the fact of disabled or poor people to participate in society. If you don't have a photo ID, you can't do a lot of things, even pulling out for Social Security, apparently going to the NAACP rally. We need those IDs. So for $11 million, we can make sure that everybody, whether they're married or not, whether they're a man or a woman, can have that ID. So I, I agree with you on that. Um, Regarding voter impersonation, I did a little bit of research. The Washington Post had an article, and it said it the News 21 did an article, a study by the Carnegie Knight Investigation Reporting Project, and they looked at 2,068 fraudulent cases of voter fraud throughout the country, and they sent basically a request to election authorities in all 50 states. I do not have a, a Missouri example, but they found 10. That's not a lot, but they found 10 cases of voter impersonation. And one of those examples was in New Hampshire, in Londonbury, New Hampshire, when a 17-year-old, Mark Luke, Lucas, used his father's name to vote George W. Bush in the Republican presidential primary. So obviously there are cases of voter impersonation. My last point is that when you're looking at Indiana and Georgia, Phil Todd made this point that voter um, participation increases. The University of Missouri did a report and found that the turnout in Indiana showed the turnout actually increased by about, hold on, I'll make sure I'm giving you the right report. Okay, this, I believe that, yeah, yeah that's the University of Missouri. Increased by about two percentage points overall for local elections. And then it went on to say that the only consistent and statistically significant impact of photo ID in Indiana is to increase voter turnout in counties with a greater percentage of Democrats relative to other counties. Now, I don't know if that's more Democrats voting, but in Democratic counties, the voter participation turned out increased. And I believe that if you're Democrat, Republican, Constitution Party, Libertarian, or another independent, you want to know that your vote counts. And if we have photo ID and we guarantee that every single person is eligible to vote by giving them their supporting documents, which I believe, and I, I don't want to speak for you, but I believe we, between you two, agree on, then we guarantee that we have fair elections, nobody's disenfranchised, and nobody has to believe that their vote's not going to count. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hubbard. Any questions of this gentleman? Please. Okay, Mr. McGowan, quick. Can you think that that University of Missouri study did that? Um, I don't have that. It was actually from another. I have. He's got it. Okay. Thank you, sir. Very much. Please fill out this form. Okay. Any questions? Any questions? Okay. Anyone else in favor of? Okay. Um, Ms. Lieberman, you want to start with the against, or do you have someone? Mr. Scott. Okay. Three minutes, Mr. Scott. You bet. 
Madam Chair, members of the committee, I'm John Scott, um, Policy Director from the Secretary of State's Office. Um, testified against the bill last year. I'm here to do the same this year. I'll talk about um, some of the things that haven't changed and then some of the things that have changed. And I will try to do it quickly. I know some people have traveled and I want to be respectful of them. Um, so here's what hasn't changed since last year. Uh, the first thing is the Secretary of State's position uh, on the legislation. Um, strongly opposed to any legislation that would disenfranchise a single eligible Missouri voter. Um, that's our belief when it comes to this bill. We're going to oppose any legislation that does that. Um, it, it, Secretary likes to say that it's his job as the chief elections official in the state to make sure that only eligible voters vote, but also that um, all eligible voters uh, have the opportunity to vote. Um, so it's something that we take very seriously and, and, and nothing uh, has changed since last year in terms of that position. Um, the second piece that hasn't changed is the content of the bill. Um, I think it's important to understand that just calling this photo identification uh, legislation sort of undersells it. Uh, it would be one of the most restrictive photo ID laws uh, in the country because of the IDs that, uh, the, the list of IDs and the way that it narrows that list. Um, and I think a lot of Missourians would be surprised to hear um, how narrow that list is and the types of IDs that they wouldn't be able to show when they came to the polls. Some of them have been discussed today. Student IDs issued by state institutions, um, expired military IDs, um, out-of-state driver's licenses that are valid, um, expired Missouri driver's license, um, voter ID cards issued by election authorities. Those are all things that are currently allowed that wouldn't be allowed uh, under this legislation. So it, 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 it's pretty extreme. Um, and you know, we put out an impact report this morning just before the committee that sort of categorizes the photo ID laws around the country. And, and Missouri would be um, one of the most strict, if not the most strict in the country under this legislation. Um, and the third thing that hasn't changed since last year is the availability of uh, photo ID laws around the country, if, if you look to other states, that get at the issue of voter impersonation fraud without disenfranchising the voter. Um, Idaho, for example, says that you have to have one of these types of photo ID to vote. And if you can't uh, produce that ID, then you sign an affidavit saying that you don't have it. You cast a regular ballot rather than a provisional ballot and that ballot is counted. Uh, the affidavit that you sign uh, is under penalty of perjury, and I think there are felony implications, and um, that, that gets tough on the issue without putting someone in the provisional ballot category. So those are the things that haven't changed. Things that have changed uh, since last year. The first thing uh, is that our office uh, announced what we call our Elections Integrity Unit. For the first time, uh, our office has a formalized process to deal with um, complaints that we hear from people around the state about elections, irregularities, issues at the polls. Um, and so we review every credible allegation of voting impropriety, anything like that. They all get a written response from our office, and we're prepared to work with uh, election authorities and law enforcement um, to make sure that election laws are, are followed around the state. It's something that we're proud of. Um, the second piece is that we have worked with the General Assembly to file legislation that um, makes our election laws tougher. Um, Senate Bill 728 is something that we've worked with Senator Scott Sifton on um, that does a few things. It first increases the maximum sentence that anyone faces if they uh, commit a class one elections offense from five years to seven years. and takes voter registration fraud, the penalties associated with it, from seven years to 15 years. It makes it a class uh, B felony. That's getting tough on the issue of voter registration fraud, extremely tough, without disenfranchising people. That's something that we're proud of. Um, it also prohibits anyone from being an elections judge or a poll watcher or a challenger if they have a class elections offense in their, in their past. It also gives those folks 30 days of shock time. No more SIS anymore. Um, so, so anyone who says that uh, the secretary isn't serious about uh, this issue or the uh, uh, strengthening our election laws isn't paying attention. Um, we've also talked to the Senate Judiciary Committee about including these pieces in uh, their criminal code uh, overhaul, and that's something that we're, we're hoping to do. Um, and then the third thing that 
Well, I guess the, the second thing that hasn't changed is, uh, or that has changed, is um, what we're seeing around the country. I, Texas has had a lot of problems with their ID law. They've had a lot of issues with women not being able to vote under their law. The former Speaker of the U.S. House got to the polls and wasn't able to vote. Um, it, was, it was pretty embarrassing for the state of Texas, and I don't want Missouri to be in that position. Um, the state of Pennsylvania just invalidated their uh, photo ID law last month on similar grounds to what Missouri did in 2006, saying that it was an undue burden on a fundamental right. Um, and, and so pretty recent history around the country where similar laws are being struck down. And the final thing that I'll point to is uh, Judge Richard Posner just this past fall in a book that he put out, uh, it's the 20th or 30th book that he's written, um, said, look, I wrote the opinion of holding the Indiana photo ID law in 2007, and he expressed regret for how the decision was reached. And it, I think that's a pretty strong condemnation of what has happened over the past few years with photo ID laws. Um, and to hang your hat on that decision, uh, I think is problematic, and, and that's something that, that we've been struck by. Uh, so just finally would encourage the members of the committee to vote against the legislation whenever it does come up uh, for a vote, and, and nothing about our position has changed since last year. Uh, the legislation is troubling. It's extreme. It goes too far. It's unfair. Questions. Uh, because you went so long, I'll ask you one question. Did you say that, I mean, as I understand, uh, when you move your change of residence to the state of Missouri, you have to get a new driver's license within 30 days. That is the law in Missouri. So are you telling me that you can vote with an Illinois driver's license in the state of Missouri? Uh, it, imagine a student who moves to Missouri and they don't. And they don't follow the law of getting a driver's license in Missouri when they intend to reside here. You don't, All right. a, you don't have to get a driver's license when you move to Missouri. If you change your residence, you're required to within 30 days. You don't have to change your, you, you have to, if you're a student, you have to say that you intend to establish residency. So you're saying that Illinois students who are going to the University of Missouri should be able to vote here even if they're a resident and intend to reside in Illinois. What you say? No, you, you say you intend to reside in... So to answer my question, an Illinois driver's license uh, where a person has moved here, expressed no indication in, in indication of residing in the state, they can vote in Missouri. That's what you're saying? No, I'm saying that a person who moves here... You, just said, you said earlier uh, that that would be a problem. Somehow this bill wouldn't allow an Illinois driver's license. That was the problem. Maybe you didn't say that. I thought that's. I'm saying that it would not be required as one of the pieces that you could use to prove your that you are who you say you are. Thank you. Ms. Newman, <laughs> to inquire, Madam Chair, uh, one really quick question too, um, uh, Mr. Scott. Can you clarify in terms of this bill um, with the state would be? Uh, mandated to pay for any underlying documents that are required to get to change their, their birth certificate? I don't see anything in the bill that requires the state to pay for any of the underlying documents, marriage license, any name change documents, any birth certificates. Um, that's included on the affidavit uh, to say why that you don't have the identification. There's nothing in the bill that says the state will pay for the underlying documents. Um, nothing in the bill that says, hey, for people who have to take off work to go obtain the documents, um, you know, we'll cover that. Who will take care of that? We'll make sure your employer can, um, you know, hold that against you. Uh, but there's a lot of things, and it's a pretty onerous process um, to get some of these documents for some people, and that's that's kind of therein lies the rub. Thank you very much. To inquire briefly. Uh, could you get the case where, in, well, there's actually 18 states that have some sort of photo ID where a person was not able to obtain the required photo ID in any of those 18 states? I don't look around the country to see what that might be a good idea. See if, I mean, because here again, we're telling the representative that this bill doesn't have purpose, yet you're giving us reasons not to do it for reasons that don't even exist. Because I haven't been able to find anywhere in the states where photo ID requirements have been so onerous to prevent someone from meeting that requirement. 
Now, there's been, like you mentioned, the person in Texas, well, they forgot their ID probably. It's not that they couldn't get one. They just, you know, I go to the airport without my ID. I'm not getting on the plane. So I'm looking for a person, and maybe the other witnesses of the I asked last year will be able to provide a case where the photo ID requirements kept someone who deserved to have that ID or needed to get it to vote was not able to get it. In some of the court cases that you can read from around the country, the, the opinions and the judges who write the cases say that they're without a doubt this will prevent people from voting. And yet, I want just one example in the whole country is all I'm looking for. But that's been true. Thank you. Any other questions for this witness? Thank you, Mr. Scott, very much. Oh. I'm going to fill out forms um, that we're against both the HJR and the bill. I'll just leave them up here. And if, if it's helpful for me to come back up and talk about why the HJR is bad, too, I can do that. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay, Madam Chairwoman, thank you. My name is Denise Lieberman. I'm a constitutional lawyer and serve as senior attorney with Advancement Project, a national voting rights organization, uh, and work on issues of voter ID around the country. I've served as counsel of record on cases involving photo ID right here in Missouri, in Wisconsin, in Pennsylvania, and now serving as lead counsel challenging a voter law in North Carolina as well. Um, this is the eighth year this measure has come before this legislature, and I think it's time to call this out for the politically expedient farce that this is. Year after year, the evidence continues to amount that there is not any valid legislative purpose behind this legislation. There has been ample studies done on issues of voter impersonation. The News 21 study that was mentioned earlier have all found that voter impersonation, the only election irregularity that this bill would address, is virtually non-existent. I defy members of this committee who seek to support this legislation to advance a valid legislative purpose that justifies potentially disenfranchising and turning into second-class citizens the 220,000 valid registered voters in the state of Missouri who currently don't have a state-issued photo ID. And I want to, since my time is limited, address a couple of, of problems with the legislation as written. Uh, Representative Dogger mentioned uh, quite a bit the exemptions that he included in his bill attempting to address uh, voters who would face barriers, hurdles, or be unable to obtain those IDs. Exemptions for senior citizens, people with disabilities, people who couldn't afford the underlying documents. I think it's very important to note that that is not an exemption at all. It actually relegates those voters to a second class of voters, voters who would be forecast provisional ballots that would not be counted unless that voter's signature match that on their original voter registration. For many people, that simply won't happen. My own mother falls into this category. She has a glitch on her birth certificate. Uh, the name under which she's registered to vote is her middle name. It is not included on her birth certificate. And thus, she could face difficulties renewing her driver's license if she has to do so. Now, even if she meets the law's so-called exemption for senior citizens because she was born before 1941, She's developed a hand tremor. She cannot duplicate her signature. And that provisional ballot won't be counted. The same is true for my client, Emmanuel Aziz, who is a 43-year-old man with multiple sclerosis. He has a Missouri driver's license and a passport, but they're expired. He has no reason to renew them and would have a virtual impossibility doing so. He also cannot duplicate his signature. The savings clauses are not savings at all. They're completely insufficient and they relegate voters without ID to second class citizens. 
uh, Representative Duger mentioned that this legislation could not go into effect unless a constitutional amendment were passed. And Representative Dunn, you asked a key question. Well, why is that? It's because the legislation as drafted is currently unconstitutional. It is unconstitutional. The Missouri Supreme Court found that it infringes on the fundamental right to vote. And that is why we have to carve out an exception to that provision of our Constitution in order for this law to exist. A representative, you, you asked a, some very valid questions about the kinds of people who stand to be affected. And I can tell you, from my work litigating these cases across the country, that there are numerous voters, for a variety of reasons, who can't get or face nearly insurmountable hurdles to obtaining forms of ID. People, for example, who have a glitch on their underlying documents, like a birth certificate, like my own mother, a former elected official here in the state of Missouri. My client, my lead plaintiff in North Carolina right now is a 93-year-old Rosanelle Eaton, whose name is spelled three different ways on her birth certificate, her voter registration, and her driver's license. Uh, without going to court and spending quite a bit of money to correct those documents, she won't be able to obtain state-issued photo ID. The reason this law is problematic, as Mr. Scott mentioned, is because the forms of identification allowed under the law are so narrow that it renders, or would render, Missouri's law among the strictest in the country. Three minutes. That's fine. In conclusion, this law is unconstitutional, it is expensive, and it would relegate hundreds of thousands of Missouri voters to second-class citizens without any valid legislative purpose, and accordingly, we urge you to vote no on this legislation. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Uh, uh, Any question, Mr. Gosen. Jim Clark, please. Quick. So, is a this is a client of yours, Rosanelle Eaton, North Carolina, who's unable to get her meet the requirements to vote in that state. That's is that right. in the court system right now, or is it being handled? Yes, it is. It's in the court system. She's one of a, a number Eaton of clients. Eaton there. versus state, or how yes. would I find that? NAACP versus North Carolina. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Please fill out a witness form. Don't forget it's three minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm, I'm going to take less time than that. I have a lot to say, but uh, I don't want to take up too much time. Uh, this, uh, this fight has been going on for eight years. Uh, and uh, I have been involved, my name is Bert Newman, I'm from St. Louis, I'm an attorney. I've been involved in it since uh, 2006. And uh, what I have seen is, uh, as this fight has gone on, those who agree with my point of view in opposition to this type of legislation have won every single battle. And those who are the proponents of this legislation have lost every single battle. And I believe they will lose this battle as well. And there are a number of reasons for that. But I want to dispel something I heard. I want to dispel the pronouncements, uh, the lengthy pronouncements about fraud in St. Louis in 2000, 2004. I tried this case. I was one of the attorneys who tried the 2006 challenge. There was no evidence of impersonation fraud. I argued this case in the uh, Missouri Supreme Court. The Supreme Court found that there was no evidence of impersonation fraud in the state of Missouri. So citing, citing statistics that mean nothing uh, only add to the farce that is behind this legislation. It is a ploy, it is a scheme to keep certain people from voting. That's all it is. And that's what I call it, and that's what I believe it to be. I want to mention one other thing. Uh, Section 25 of our Bill of Rights in our Constitution says that all elections shall be free and open, and no power, civil or military, shall at any time interfere to prevent the free exercise of the right of suffrage. I would challenge this committee to tell me how the Supreme Court is going to square that with this act this amendment passes. Because there's law in this state when a new amendment conflicts with one or more, 
existing constitutional amendments, the new amendment will not stand. This amendment will not stand. This uh, legislation will not stand. As Denise said, unconstitutional based on the Cruikshank case, Cruikshank case, and nothing has changed since then to make it constitutional. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Newman. Thank you. Next, please do not forget to fill out a witness card. I did. Thank you, sir. Three minutes. Good morning, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, and members of the committee. My name is uh, Peg Prendergast, and I am uh, on the board of directors for the League of Women Voters. I thank you for allowing me um, to present our testimony this morning. The right of every citizen to vote has been a basic legal principle since its founding. We stand in opposition to the proposed constitutional amendment, HJR 47 and HB 1073, the subject of today's hearings. 1073 limits forms of ID acceptable at the polls only to current Missouri or federal photo IDs with photos and expiration dates. Typically, a current Missouri driver's or non-driver's license. Those without ID would have to cast a provisional ballot that would not count unless the voter returned with proper ID. The state would provide ID without cost to those needing one, but would not cover the cost of the underlying documents, except for what I heard today in, the, in these amendments, like a certified birth certificate needed to get the ID. Each of you have a mother, sister, or a wife, or knows of one who has changed her name due to marriage, divorce, or remarriage. What would it take for those to obtain these underlying documents necessary to meet the requirements of the law? Do your grandparents still have valid driver's license? Could they obtain certified copies of documents necessary to meet the requirements of the law? Do your children or friends' children attend college in a different Missouri town? Does their driver's license have their college address on it? Yes, certain groups such as seniors, people with disabilities, or religious uh, objection would be exempt from the requirement, but must pass the provisional ballot, which would not count unless the voter's signature matched their registration. The cost of Missouri taxpayers for the implementation of these proposals, I've heard numbers between six and seven million dollars, the League is most perplexed that in the middle of a budget crisis that the Missouri Legislature would waste a large amount of money on a program that claims to solve a problem that doesn't exist. We have never seen evidence of voter impersonation that has been presented and these proposals do nothing to address voter registration or absentee voting problems. Voter fraud is already a serious crime in Missouri, punishable by what someone has already said here, by five years in prison and $10,000 crime. The League of Women Voters has testified against this bill requiring voters and present government issued photo ID for several years. I testified before this House Elections Committee in February of 2011. Ms. Pendergrass? Yes. Thank you, Doctor. All right. Like just to say closing statement. All right. I will. Elections should be free, fair, and accessible to all who are eligible. We commend the recent online registration system implementation in Missouri. That is a step forward. HJR 47 and HB 1073 are serious steps backwards, and we urge you to reject them. Thank you. Please fill out a brief form. Questions? Oh, excuse me. Questions, Mr. Gosen? Yes. Fire, please. Um, I'm going to ask you the same question I asked the last person. I was given a name. However, that is a person that's contending they would have difficulty getting a photo ID. It's still in first. I'm still looking for someone who has not been able to get a photo ID in order to vote or to meet their state requirements in order to vote. Does, does your organization have such a person? You know, personally, I do, I'm not aware of that because I don't go searching for that. But I will go back to my organization and. Uh, representative, I will send you that information. I, I would definitely appreciate that. Not someone that's contending, but someone that it was found out, you know, or they said, you know, no, they could not get a photo ID to vote. Okay, Thank very you. good. Okay, how many more do we have? Okay, any other questions? 
Okay, we have three more. We're good. We folks, I, I don't know. I don't know what we need to do here. I don't want to ask you to come back uh, unless you have something new to offer. Please make it just as quick as you can make it. Okay. Jeanette Von Oxford on behalf of the Missouri Association for Social Welfare. I thank Madam Chair and members of the committee. Um, first, uh, I, I recognize that there's some attempt to help people with low incomes in this bill, uh, but it's already a real challenge for people who are poor to manage to vote with the laws as we have it now. I literally know some folks who only have two days off a whole year, uh, and they get to their multiple jobs by public transportation. We could make it way easier for poor people to vote. You could say, well, look, low income people have a lower voting rate. They have challenges to voting, and we could address that. This bill makes it harder, because uh, once you hear on the news, oh, you have to have a photo ID, and you know you have, you don't have time to manage that with your rent eviction notices and your utility shutoff notices and all the struggles that people with low incomes have. They just say, ah, voting's a luxury. I can't manage it. Um, the other group of people, um, I wish that Gus Sparrett could be with you today, uh, but Gus has died, like a lot of those World War II vets. Gus would say, don't take away my friend Brenda's right to vote. Brenda's a transgender woman that I go to church with. Uh, before Brenda transitioned to uh, being female and public, um, Brenda was a Vietnam vet uh, who um, uh, this, this armed bombs was part of Brenda's job of when a Vietnam soldier. Um, but Brenda now could not have an ID that matches uh, her, her driver's license, does not match who she lives as in the world, and she can't afford to have the surgery that would make it possible for her to get the documentation in Missouri it would take to have a, a driver's license that matches who she lives at in, in the world. So um, uh, Representative Gosen is wanting an example of somebody who would be disenfranchised it hasn't happened yet, but if you pass this bill, it will happen because my friend Brenda will not be able to vote, nor will my friend Beverly. Um, so there are folks who are not going to be able to have a photo ID that matches who they live as. And I care about them voting. And some of them are veterans who have uh, fought for our country and should have the right to vote. Um, so this, this bill is a problem uh, until we make it uh, more possible uh, for people to, to have a photo ID that matches when they're transgender. And we don't have those laws currently in our state. I welcome any questions you may have. Any questions? Thank you, ma'am, very much. Please go on with this form. It's been a long day, ma'am, Chairman, already. Um, my name is Adolphus Pruitt. First Vice President of Missouri NAACP. I want to offer just a couple of quick facts. It's one, I know the gentleman came up with a flyer for North Carolina. I think he ought to know that we have people going to jail over this issue. And that's why they have them to bring IDs with them to those rallies. It's sort of convenient to be able to identify yourself when they put you in handcuffs over voter rights. So yeah, I think if he read the flyer or attended one, maybe we can invite him down to North Carolina. And he could join us in that fight down there. I know they talked about the uh, driver's license a little bit. Well, just one bit of information. If you work for a transportation company in Illinois and you lived in Missouri, you require to have a CDL license. That company is going to require you to have an Illinois CDL license. You can't have an Illinois CDL license and have a Missouri driver's license. So you'll be a Missourian, living in Missouri, paying taxes in Missouri, voting in Missouri. Working in Illinois, driving an old road truck with a CDL license, and you could not vote under this bill. You couldn't use that identification to vote in Missouri because you would not have a Missouri ID. Uh, the the other thing that is int more interesting is the fact that uh, the GAO did a report they released in 2012 that looked at all of the states with voter IDs, and I think that was about, roughly about 30, 31. Then it's 32 now. Only 11 of them acquired a photo ID, the other 20 uh, did not. And, and so when you talked about problems, those that don't require it have not had any problems. As a matter of fact, there was a five-year study done on R.W. Bush, and he was in office that looked at voter fraud across the country over five years, and they came up with 86 cases. 86 cases, five years nationwide. The only other thing I want to say, I'm a little, I'm, I think we need to change the, 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 I, I can't admit it, but change the title of this bill because I heard my representative up there say that, and I, I hope I'm not misquoting you, but I heard the essence of his argument was that that 
he is concerned and want to prevent voting and residents voting in St. Louis and the St. Louis area from outvoting residents in outstate Missouri, in particular county. And in essence, that's what he said. That's exactly what he said. And to sit up here in a committee where we're talking about one of the most precious rights that you can have in this country. You know, in 1934, we had black democratic preaching uh, captain killed in Kansas City uh, by whites didn't want him voting. We had whites with guns in Holland, Missouri, back in there preventing people from voting. And you're going to tell me you, your concern is with a vote ID bill is to keep people from St. Louis voting outstate Missouri in the election. Matter of fact, they can't be doing too well. But last time I checked, the House and the Senate was supermajority Republican. So whatever we're doing in St. Louis is not working, because I can assure you we would have changed what's going on up in here. I'm done. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 I just, I, I hate how people put words in my mouth. So but you put this in there. Just to, to clarify, I'm not worried about, I, I can do basic math. I know there are more people in St. Louis than there are, as you call, outstate Missouri. My argument is that the, the numbers that we look at, um, you know, there's the opportunity there for more votes by individual people than what are in outstate Missouri. I, I understand the dynamics between where people live in the state. And, and the whole the whole part about Democrat, Republican, black, white, I, I, I don't know where that argument's coming from. I never said anything about Democrat, Republican, how they vote. I think everybody deserves to have one vote. One vote. Sir, the, proof, the proof's in the pudding. The opportunity for voter fraud is there. You cannot deny it. No one can look me in the face and say, when you have dead people on the rolls, people register to vote on vacant lots. It's the only way to catch voter fraud is to catch them in the act. Once they vote and they leave the vote, the, the ballot box, it's too late. That that ballot is in the box. So unless we have someone at the polling places. Verifying the people who are voting or who are registered, you can't catch those folks. Right now, I can take your uh, ele electric bill. If I know your name, address, I go up, use your name, show them that, hey, here's my electric bill, and I vote under your name. That's not right. Ma Madam Chairman. Uh, one quick point. In Salt Lake City, there was an article, and it says, warning every parent with a teenager or young student in college, getting a fake ID is as easy as getting a mouse. Matter of fact, they said they come back so good from China that they had the state holly ground, watermarks, even the barcodes on the back that one undercover investigator told us is the best he's ever seen. So if the issue is the ID. If, if, if people want to commit, commit voter fraud, and the issue of getting an ID, they can get one. That's they'll, not the issue. They'll do it in the same way. Well, see, there you go again. Okay. Whoa, 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 whoa. Only, only oh, if we're, we're going to come up with photo ID, then they'll just find a, a inroads around it to get fake IDs. I mean, why, why would you? We're talking about voting here. The fundamental right that we're talking about. Mr. You're talking about an issue that someone will go out and try to find a fake photo ID. Mr. McGough and Mr. Prick. I think, okay, okay. Let's let's move on to the next person that wants to testify. If there's no other questions of Mr. Prick. Thank you, committee. Please fill out a form. I'm kind of scared. Um, <laughs> Madam Chairwoman and members of the committee, my name is Crystal Williams. I'm a registered lobbyist for the uh, American Civil Liberties Union in Missouri, and I don't think we have anything else to add, but I'm happy to answer the questions. Thank you, ma'am. Are there any questions? Please wait. Okay, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Madam 
Chair members of the committee, I'll be on behalf of Missouri MEA. We have also spoken in opposition to the joint resolution and to the similar bills in the past. Just about all my members work in Missouri public schools, so they're employed by public elected officials, mostly school board members. So we're, we have a concern about making sure that we respect the integrity of that process. Uh, while we oppose the joint resolution, we've often spoken in favor of legislation by that bill sponsor to reinstate the board elections that we have non-election elections. So that's, that's a concern to us. That's something we'd like you guys to move forward on, making sure every school board member gets actually elected and not elected by default. But when it comes to this issue, we look at the we look to guidance uh, for our guidance from the Supreme Court, and they say we have concerns about the law that was passed in 2006. And so that speaks to our concern about the Constitution. We, we look at what they said. They said, the Constitution tells us we should have a concern about the Senate Bill 1019 because it would suppress voters, uh, suppress the vote amongst the most vulnerable. That sounds like, from our perspective, a constitutional provision that's correct, uh, is guiding the court in the right direction. Um, and so for that reason, we opposed the joint resolution. And we also then would have the bill because the, the folks who have looked at it at the highest level of our Supreme Court speak to those concerns. Uh, we haven't seen a lot of convincing evidence that this particular remedy would actually make a difference. The way we look at it, if someone's improperly registered, that seems to be the issue of real concern. If they're improperly registered and then they show a photo ID, I think they get to vote. Uh, so the, 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 the real concern and we, what we urge the committee to focus on is, is there work that that our hardworking Kent County election officials need the help, the guidance. What is it going to take to improve in a, an era where people are moving around all over the place? How do we improve that? This just doesn't seem to us to be part of that solution. But we're happy to answer any questions the committee may have. Thank you very much. Any questions of this witness? Any questions of this witness? Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, sir. Any other uh, people to speak in opposition to the bill? Three minutes, please. Thank you, sir. I'm Wayne Lee, disability advocate. I'm here to basically testify in opposition to the bill, but I'm curious about a few things. One thing for sure, everybody gets one of these cards. Uh, you go to your clerk, county clerk, you get a card, you're going to vote. They've already ID. So I'm curious as to why I need to go and get my picture taken. And I echo what other people have said here. There's no reason for me to need that. I don't need to have a photo ID. I wouldn't think. And also, I am very, very curious as to just why people need to have to get this done. Mark Oxford. That Ms. Mott Oxford already made the point that people having to go get their photo IDs, that kind of thing, I think we need more people out voting. And getting photo IDs are going, we're going to suppress voters by doing that, is the fear that I have. And I trained as a chaplain in Tennessee State Prison. That's where I did a lot of my training as a chaplain. I trained in other places too. When I was at the seminary, and I promise you, that if a person wants to go ahead and get a fake ID, they can do that with no problem whatsoever. That's not going to be a difficult task for them. So if a person is really serious about doing photo ID, getting a fake photo ID and voting fraudulently, that's really what this bill is all about. They'll be able to do that with no problem whatsoever. I can promise you that because, as I said, I spent a lot of time there in training in the Tennessee State Prison and also in the juvenile institute. And these people, when they work, when they're both fraudulent, when they provide, do these fraudulent IDs, they know what they're doing. They're good at it. And there are plenty of people all over the place to get that done. It can be accomplished with ease. So if there's really photo ID fraud, voter fraud, no problem. No people will accomplish that. Okay. Any, any questions of Mr. Lee? Okay. Thank you, sir, very much. Please fill out a witness form. Anyone else in opposition to the bill? Okay, thank you. Anyone here to speak for informational purposes only? Okay, thank you. 
Uh, this will close the hearing on this bill. Uh, due to our time limit today, and I apologize for this, but uh, we'll hear Mr. Cox's HDR next week. Uh, and we will exact on both bills next week. And I apologize for having to ask you all to come back. But because due to uh, the emotional part of this bill, I think we're best served if we take Mr. Cox's bill up next week. So thank you very much for coming today. If you have questions of the committee or uh, of the um, uh, bill, please let us know. Thank you.